Uh, Dr. Kathy Bonham from the University of Chicago who's going to touch on treatments uh, or therapies in current research. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It's really exciting to be here. I've not actually talked um, in front of a patient group before, so uh, bear with me. These are brand new slides. Um, the first thing I wanted to tell you, though, was um, I was sort of inspired by Dr. Tabby's um, storytelling to tell you sort of the origin story of why I research sarcoidosis and why it's important to me. Um, because sometimes giving that kind of personal touch is, is important, right? So. Um, how did I get to be in front of you? So um, when I was a trainee, I met two patients that changed my life. So one of them was um, a 30-year-old woman I took care of her in the ICU. She had terrible sarcoidosis. She had it chewed up her lungs. And she was in the ICU and she was on a ventilator, a breathing machine. And, uh, and she was dying from her sarcoidosis. She was. The same day, I met a man in clinic so this is like one of these things that you do and they train you, right? It's sort of like making a dime and if the pressure doesn't kill you, it makes you shine. Right? So I had to do clinic two in addition to doing the ICU. And I saw him and he was 70, he was on oxygen, he was coming like for his third opinion for sarcoidosis and what can I do? All of my treatments are failing, right? Um, his name was Henry, the lady's name was Sam. And at the end of that day, after taking care of those two people, I had to drive home, you know, because I had to see my my family, my son was like six months old at the time. And so, you know, you gotta try to balance that, right? Um, and when I got out of the car at the end of the day, I said, you know what? I need to fix sarcoidosis. Like, people are suffering. When I look at this disease, there is no research, there's no evidence for what I can do for these people, you know? And I have resources, I work at a big university, I can do this, and so. I marched into my research advisor's office, you know, a couple months later after I'd gotten off the ICU, and I said, forget, forget all those things I talked about researching, I want to do sarcoidosis. And he told me, um, we don't have sarcoidosis research here. <laughs> Whatever you do, you gotta build it, you know, and we'll help you, but, and that's a story for another day. Um, but the moral I wanted to get at when I, when I talked to you is that, Sometimes we don't realize the connections that we make with other people. Those two um, patients that I that I treated, that I worked with, um, I don't think they know the impact still that I that they had on me and how they changed how I thought about sarcoidosis. Um, and they they changed my life. They changed my career. And so, if you are, um, especially when you see young people, young doctors, young nurses. They're still in that stage where they're thinking about what they're going to do with their lives. And, and please connect with them and tell them about sarcoidosis and what your experience is like, because you don't know. Um, those two people change me. Um, and I think that the more that we talk about sarcoidosis, um, the better. And I think that um, we, have to, we have to always remember that. So the power of sarcoidosis is in our future, in our future people. And it's not, it's not drugs and it's not um, companies, it's actually connecting with one another. Right. So with that, it was a little long. Um, so whenever I talk about treatments and research, it's important to know that um, I don't have any support, financial or otherwise, from anybody drug companies or industry sponsors. The NIH pays my salary to do research with sarcoidosis and take care of sarcoidosis patients. And uh, all my money goes to sort of feeding and care of these three characters, using my three boys. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about emerging therapies, uh, medications and non-medications, and also the current research. And of course, there's a lot of research going on, so I can't tell you about everything, but I'll tell you about some of the most interesting things that are, are coming out now. So it, it is actually a really exciting time to learn about sarcoidosis. Um, there's international efforts that are underway right now to sort of organize sarcoidosis better. Um, the last official guideline on this was actually published in 1999. So think about where you were in 1999, different world then. We know a lot more now. 
Um, I'm part of the American Thoracic Society Task Force, uh, and we just got some funding to begin meetings this May. And we're going to make a new guideline on how to officially diagnose sarcosis, and I think that's going to help a lot with organizing um, the way that we diagnose patients, and then that results in better treatments too. The European Respiratory Society has already convened on a treatment guideline, and so we're going to see that come out probably in the next year or two. Uh, and again, this is important because as we organize and sort of make the treatment experience for patients less different, you know, you may have had very different treatments depending on who you saw, right? And that makes studying a disease very difficult. How do you how do you study a disease when everybody's doing something different, right? Um, so that that is happening, and that's pretty exciting. Um, we heard a lot about prednisone. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time to belabor that point. So prednisone obviously is, uh, has some pros to it. It's cheap, it's available, it's been used for many years, uh, and still many people do get steroids. Of course, you guys know all about the side effects. They're undesirable. I took prednisone for a period of time last summer. It made me crazy. Um, <laughs> I was up cleaning my kitchen in the middle of the night. You may have experienced that. Um, We've uh, had other speakers talk about some of the oral medications, right? <laughs> yeah, I won't, I won't believe with that. Um, there's also, of course, injectable or infusion. Acfar is an injectable, uh, and uh, we've heard a little bit about that already. And then, of course, the IV infusions, uh, there are several. Um, they are uh, useful, uh, they are expensive, uh, for they're, so they're usually not the first ones we go to, um, but they are out there. So let's talk about new things. So uh, some interesting trials that are going on right now. Um, there's one that's sponsored through Vanderbilt in Tennessee. Dr. Wonder Drake is a great scientist and she's running that one. It's called the CLEAR trial. So this is a trial to look at anti-mycobacterial therapy. So these are uh, antibiotics, anti-inflammatories that have been around for a long time. There's been speculation in science that one of the things that is inside a granuloma could be what's called a mycobacterium. So this is a bacteria that's in the water and the soil. And uh, we think that perhaps treating that may offer patients some help, especially for symptoms with progressive lung disease. And that's about 80% of the world, I believe, right now. Um, she's still um, recruiting. There's other science that looks at, and this comes from some of the um, patients that have uh, enrolled in clinical data gathering, so like these registries, where we look and see kind of what risk factors did you have that may have contributed to uh, your sarcoidosis, and why is your sarcoidosis progressive? We've noticed that in some patients, it seems that having smoking uh, history changes the course of the disease. And so uh, there's a trial right now for nicotine patches to improve the function of the T cells. The T cells are these immune cells that are actually surrounding the granuloma, or they're part of the granuloma. So we think that improving the T cell function there, maybe through nicotine therapy, not smoking, it's not the same. Um, we don't advise that. But nicotine therapy may be helpful. And that's one that Dr. Uh, Krauser's running at Ohio State. It's a 26-week trial with um, patients that have symptomatic lung disease and abnormal x-rays. Other interesting stuff, and again, there are many, many trials and lots of research on sarcoid. I think um, one of the best resources for looking at now is to go to the FSR website because they'll they can kind of give you an idea of what trials are and then of course you can always ask your doctors too. Um, sometimes there are trials that um, they can't publicize right away but they're being run through your university or a big academic center um, and they can tell you more about it. One of the more interesting ones I've seen is canakinumab so that's a it's a drug that blocks a specific signal that goes from cell to cell called IL-1, and that's an injectable therapy. Again, that's for some patients with lung disease. It's sponsored by the drug company that makes it. And then we've heard a little bit about this Acthar drug. Uh, this is an interesting drug. Again, it's kind of an old drug that has been brought back because it stimulates your own uh, system to make the steroids themselves. Okay, so prednisone is a steroid. Actar is working through that system that Dr. Gibson described where you're actually um, making your own steroids within your body. There isn't good evidence that Actar is really um, changing outcomes or better than prednisone yet. It's not been studied in sort of the most rigorous way that we like to see in the scientific trials. 
Uh, there are case reports though, patients that are on this therapy who are getting some um, favorable effects, so less of sort of the steroid or prednisone effects that people have, the weight gain and the mood changes. There are some people that are reporting they're getting a little bit less of that. And so um, and the company is sponsoring some trials to look at that now, uh, looking specifically at those steroid sparing effects and also at the effects on uh, eye and skin and neurologic um, sarcoidosis. Okay, other stuff. So again, some drugs are looking really at blocking some of those T cells. So these again are those cells within the granulomas and sarcoid. And we think if we can block those T cell signals that result in inflammation, one pathway uh, that's a molecular pathway in the cells is called the JAK pathway. We think if we can block that, um, that may help with some of the inflammation of sarcoid and hopefully um, some of the progressive symptoms that happen. There's a trial right now looking at eye inflammation that's sponsored by Gilead, who's um, interested in making that drug for market. And then finally, sort of another molecular pathway is called mTOR. So mTOR is a molecular pathway that um, works to uh, fuel the innate immune response. So your immune system has multiple kind of cells that are working, and one of them is sort of the first responder cells when you get challenged by something. So say if you get a bacteria or a virus, these cells are the first ones to respond and they work through the mTOR pathway. So there's some very interesting science now looking at those, and Dr. Weikart, who's recently gotten one of the grants from FSR, is looking at, it's looking at that in skin sarcoidosis. Okay, so that's all some of the medications that are out there and kind of scientifically how they're working. Um, there are some treatments, of course, that don't involve medications. Um, this is a really interesting study, I think, that recently came out. I think it was published a couple of weeks ago. It's called the PROCASARE study. It's kind of a terrible acronym, right? But it was done in Germany, and there were almost 300 patients that participated in this study. And what they did was they enrolled them in a very um, focused and intense um, pulmonary rehab program. So some of you may have done pulmonary rehab. In America, we usually do this as an outpatient, right? In this study, they did it as an inpatient. And so uh, these patients, after a, a pretty good, great program, I thought, of sort of physical therapy and breath training and making them stronger, after about three weeks, they all reported they had better quality of life and their shortness and breath, breath improved. And then some of those sort of qualitative symptoms that people uh, report, the anxiety, depression, also improved and they were able to walk farther. This is actually the, it's kind of small, but you can see kind of the things that they did within this program. And this is some of the stuff I think that we could do here. Um, so they did endurance training, for example. Um, so this would be like walking or Nordic bike or using a bike. They would do that um, three to five times a week um, to work on their training. They did strength training three sessions a week for 30 to 60 minutes. Um, and they also did respiratory physiotherapy, so we like breathing exercises. But again, using those kind of non-medical therapies can really help with some of those symptoms, as well as improve sort of the measures that the doctors are looking at in clinic, right? Those, those walk distances, how far can you go? All right. So then let's talk about some science. So, you know, in research we talk about kind of two different forms of science, but it's all science, right? So there's science that we do in the clinic that really looks at patient characteristics and how patients respond to therapies. And then there's sort of the bench or lab science where we're really looking at the cells and molecules in the lab and we're doing some science under the microscope, if you will, right? So science in the clinic. Um, so there, this is a study that has also come out of Europe recently. Uh, this was published just last month, European Respiratory Journal. Um, so this is coming from patient registries. So similar to what we have here uh, that the foundation runs, uh, many universities like, like Pitt here has their own registry. Um, we have our registry in Chicago uh, and there's efforts to kind of link these things together so that we get bigger patient groups and we have more data to be able to see what's really going on with different kinds of patients. So in this registry, this was multi multiple sites all over Europe and about 2,000 people participated. 
And what they're able to see in the data is that um, not all sarcoidosis is alike. I mean, to some extent, you guys already know this, right? That not, you are all different. And so, but this is scientifically telling us that patients really cluster into five different types of sarcoidosis based on the features that um, they're reporting in terms of their medical testing, what the doctors see on their exam, what we see on the x-rays, what we see on the scans. Um, there's abdominal. Uh, interestingly, the patients that have eye, heart, uh, skin, and neurologic, CNS, sarcoid actually all cluster together. Um, and then also patients that have musculoskeletal, so this is muscles and joints, um, also tend to have skin symptoms along with it. All right, and then there's pulmonary, of course, all together. And in the data, what they do is they kind of put this in their big machine learning algorithm in the computer, and then what they see is that patients sort of cluster together, and you can see those sort of clusters of dots there that show you that how these patients are grouping. And it's sort of interesting, you know, what the authors reported in this was these five new clinical phenotypes will be useful to rec recruit homogenous cohorts in future biomedical studies. And what that really is is doctor and scientists talk to say, you know, this is not uh, the be all and end all. This is sort of a, a good piece of information. But what it really, what we really need to do is define these types of patients so that when we then decide design our next study, which tells you about prognosis and treatment, so the outcomes that, of course, we all really care about, right? Um, that means that we'll be able to study them that much better and sort of begin to personalize the treatment, you know, so you can actually match the treatment you have to the patient that's in front of you. And that's what's really exciting. Um, so uh, there's also some uh, studies in the clinic now coming out uh, from this one is from the UK, uh, which is talking about sort of what are some of the big risk factors for patients that develop sort of the life limiting complications of sarcoidosis, right? These are big problems that we need to solve. So, all, all manifestations of sarcoidosis are important. In this study, though, they did um, find that especially the patients that get a high burden. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis, which is scarring in the lungs, so more than 20% of the lungs being scarred on the scan, and patients that get pulmonary hypertension, uh, which we talked about a little bit today, that's high blood pressure in the lung circulation. Those patients really have to be watched carefully, and we need to treat those patients very aggressively if, they, if, that, if those complications occur and they progress, because those are the patients that, um, that can die of their sarcoidosis. Um, the, and, I, and that's the study from the UK in that upper graph. Um, one of the things that I studied um, was pulmonary hypertension as well, and that's that bottom graph is mine. So for example, in our patients in, at the University of Chicago, if we diagnose pulmonary hypertension in those patients, they have a seven times greater uh, risk of having death over the next 10 years. That's when I look back in some of the records, and that's despite our best efforts at treating those individuals. So again, when we talk about big problems in sarcoidosis, we need to solve pulmonary hypertension is definitely one of them, along with all the other um, complications we talked about today. Uh, this is another piece of data that I published uh, in that study where I was looking at pulmonary hypertension patients. So the takeaway point, there's a lot of words and numbers on this um, slide, but um, you know, what we were able to show is that it's not just defining a condition like pulmonary hypertension and sarcoid. You then have to pick the patients that match to the therapies that we have, right? So in these patients, when we really did all the tests and we were able to define what kind of pulmonary hypertension we had, we then could put them on specific therapy for that. And when we have those patients, what this graph is showing you is um, in the red, CO and CI there are cardiac output and cardiac index. And you can see over a year on the right kind of therapy, their cardiac output, which is how well the heart is pumping, how well the blood is going forward, it doubles. Their pulmonary vascular resistance, which is the pressure inside the vessels in the, in the lungs, goes down by half. And, and they feel a lot better. And that's the important thing. So it's matching the right 
kind of patients with the right kind of medication, and that's what matters. That's what needs to be done, I think, with sarcoidosis and what we're trying to achieve. One big obstacle in research right now is making sure that we are capturing everyone who has sarcoidosis, right? So even in the big studies, and this is the table of demographics from the European study I just showed you, the one that was recently published with 2,000 people in it, you can see in that graph there uh, that the patients who have some of the worst disease, so these are patients that have fibrosis of the lungs in their skin. Remember, these are the patients that are more likely to die of their sarcoidosis. Are only maybe 5% of that study. So, you know, we're not enrolling all the patients that we could to really study the bad complications of sarcoidosis. And that's important to really move the field forward, right? Uh, okay. I'm going to move on and talk really quickly so I don't. Uh, interrupt lunch about lab signs. Um, so again, this is a really important era now for studying sarcoidosis. We have some new technologies now that make studying sarcoidosis a lot better. So those of you who had bronchoscopy, did anyone have endobronchial ultrasound? This is where we use a special tool to help us biopsy the lymph nodes. So this is now what's done. It should be standard of care in bronchoscopy for sarcoidosis because the main thing we see in sarcoidosis is enlargement of the lymph nodes. So we used to have to do surgery where we open up your chest and get a biopsy of the lymph node that way, if there was no other way to get you a biopsy, right? So, but now we can do a scope, and it's an outpatient procedure, and what we do is we go down to that scope, and we do a little ultrasound of your lymph nodes, and then we get a sample of those lymph nodes. And that makes the diagnosis of sarcoidosis for you, okay? Uh, it's really non-invasive other than putting you to sleep. Uh, I've done this procedure many, many times for people and you go home the same day. Um, the exciting thing from the research perspective though, uh, I think moving forward, and we're beginning to see some studies of this now, is that, um, of course, when we're doing this biopsy for someone, we can ask if they'd like to participate in research also related to that. So in addition to making a diagnosis for them, we can then take some of that tissue from the lymph nodes and begin to understand what the immune cells are in those lymph nodes, because that is really the core of sarcoidosis, right? Um, and what those studies are beginning to show is that there are cells in those biopsies that we have not seen before. They're not in the blood, because the immune system in the blood is different than the lungs. Um, some of those cells are called Th17.1 cells, and that's kind of some of the new hot stuff in sarcoidosis now. Um, but again, you know, we're dealing with a disease that affects specific organs and it, it affects the immune system. And the immune system is a compartmentalized thing in the body. And so now we have some new technology to be able to look at those, the, those immune cells in a different way. I think that's, that's actually really exciting. All right. Another thing you might hear about sarcoidosis research is this term called the microbiome, right? This sounds like a movie with Polly Shore in it or something. Um, but what that is, is scientific speak for studying all the types of bacteria, virus, and fungus that live in the body and how they change the way that we respond to disease. And especially when you study something that affects different parts of the body, it affects some parts of the body that have very specialized immune systems, like lungs, um, you, uh, you find that when a person's microbiome changes, in other words, the, the bacteria, for example, in the lungs that are living there, may change with time and disease, and we're seeing that. Um, so if anybody's ever taken antibiotics, for any reason, for example, and got some stomach upset or had some bathroom issues after that, you know it when you take antibiotics and your bacteria and your gut changes, it changes the way your body works, right? Um, and we're finding that's true also in the lungs and in other parts of the body where neuro neurosarcoidosis um, or cardiac sarcoidosis is happening. Um, and so there's lots of research now in, in microbiome and sarcoidosis. Okay. And then I wanted to touch a little bit on the causes. So this is something I think 
Ever since somebody described sarcoidosis 100, 100 years ago, we wanted to know what is in those granulomas, right? So if you were to get a biopsy of, um, of a sarcoidosis tissue, what would you see? There's these little, and so in the midst of all of this ocean of cells, right, there's these things that are like, they look like little ships traveling in there, don't they? Those are the granulomas, these little clumps of cells, clusters of cells, and uh, people have been trying to define what is in the middle of that that is causing that reaction so that we can stop it. Um, some of the recent research that has come to the fore is, uh, could it be the bacteria that causes acne? Could it be that mycobacteria that I mentioned before? This is a bacteria that's common in the water and the soil. Um, and that's one recent uh, publication, again, talking about acne bacteria. Uh, in the end, this is most likely to be, as Dr. Gibson mentioned, a multiple, a multiple interaction, an interaction between the immune system that you inherited from your family and the things that over a lifetime you've been exposed to. Um, the science is getting better now where we're actually, we don't have to grow out bacteria and culture anymore. We can actually sequence the DNA uh, in the midst of the granuloma and begin to look for the fragments of stuff that was once there. And that's what these studies are really looking at. And when they look at those kind of fragments of maybe what, what is the immune system trying to surround? The mycobacteria or P. acne, the acne bacteria, maybe, maybe some of those. And then the other exciting thing now in science is beginning to look at the genetics of sarcoidosis a little bit better. Um, this is a, a paper that uh, my colleagues at uh, University of Illinois in Chicago published recently. Um, they were looking at a special kind of genetic material called microRNA. And this is something that actually we didn't even know about five or 10 years ago. They're little tiny fragments of genetic material that's in your cells. And they began to look at comparing patients that had sarcoidosis to those that did not. And they were able to define that there is a genetic signature that's very specific to sarcoidosis in microRNA. And you can see from the back of the room, they lined up their microRNA study of patients with sarcoidosis and patients that didn't. And the, the red is genes that were upregulated and the blue is genes that were downregulated. And you can see from the back that they're very different, right? When you line up a sarcoidosis patient with someone who does not have sarcoidosis, they have a very different genetic signature. And that's telling us that there are specific gene products that get changed in sarcoidosis. And this is a way that we can begin to think of sarcoidosis in a less biased way. So when we have science, um, we go in with a, with a scientific hypothesis. I think this is what's happening. I want to go and test it. But if you think about that, there's a flaw in that approach, right? Is that you have to think of the right thing to test, right? And I think that's one of the problems in research in sarcoidosis is sometimes when you have a disease that's this um, different in everybody and changing through time, sometimes it's difficult to define with the technology we have what the problem really is that you want to test. And so that's where the power of things like genetic studies come in, because you can do this kind of study and begin to look at the genes that are, that are upregulated or downregulated, and it helps you think of something that you hadn't thought of before. So now we can test in sarcoidosis, what are those genes really doing? And is, that's the path that we have to look at. And so this is, this is stuff that's kind of in its infancy, right? But I think in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna start seeing um, more downstream effects of those genetic studies and, and find new things that are happening with sarcoidosis. It is so important, when, especially when we do uh, genetic studies, um, is that we include everybody, right? So one of the flaws, for example, in this study that I have up here right now, is that it was done in people that enrolled in the study in 1999. It was a great study. We learned a lot from it. But there were not very many African Americans who signed up for that study. So this is a representation of sarcoidosis in Caucasian Americans. We already know that there are big differences in African Americans, right? Just from what we know in the clinic, right? So even in our talks today, we said, well, you know, for example, 
why do white women get neurosarcoidosis more? We don't know, right? And similarly, when we do genetic studies to do this sort of unbiased approach of finding out what the problem is with sarcoidosis, if we don't include everybody, we won't find the problems that we can test to help everybody, right? So this is really important to make sure that, um, you know, when we're, when, for example, if you're ever approached for a study, um, please consider signing up, right? So that we can really get a good representation of, of what sarcoidosis really means. All right, good. So I'll leave some questions. I guess we're going to do a panel, so no questions. You have my contact there. Thanks, everybody.